All right, uh, panel ground rules. Questions will come through this mic over here. Do, do remember we are uh, we are recording and stuff like that, so that's why we're making you come up and actually talk into the mic. Like even if you're loud, that doesn't necessarily help the home audience. Because, because we are not full, if you're sitting in this section, I'm going to recommend that you move over that way so that A, you can get to where we'll be able to ask questions, and B, um, you'll have a better experience in terms of eye contact and what have you. It just makes it easier on everybody who's up here. All right. Uh, this is the fluffy bunny that I'm going to hand to each of the people to, to do the thing. All right. This is an Ask Me Anything. So I'm going to ask each of, the, each of our uh, panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, they have a couple of minutes to do that, talk a little bit about their company, why they're here today, and then um, I'll kick it off with a question. If you have a question, simply start lining up there. Don't wait for topics and stuff like that. What is your burning thing that you want to know? We have an amazing group of experts up here. So line up and we'll get to your questions. If not, you're going to have to put up with my questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everett Taves is from Rackspace. Rackspace is one of the reasons that the Austin technical community is as awesome as it is. I'll let him take it from there. Thanks, Boyd. Uh, yeah, like I said, my name is Everett Taves. I uh, work at Rackspace as a, a backend developer and a developer advocate. Right now, I'm working on a product known as Karina. Uh, it's a thing that creates cluster managers for you, like Jeff was describing. Hey. Thanks. Uh, Mike Robb, um, I'm with Oracle. And here because Oracle bought Stack Engine late last year. So um, <clears throat> as it was announced at Open World last month, Container Cloud Service will come out shortly based on what was Stack Engine. Basically, if I heard Jeff right, it would be in the lines of a cluster manager, container management service, um, very complementary to our other PaaS products. Thanks. Uh, good morning. My name is Joseph Holly. I'm a solutions architect for Google Cloud Platform. Obviously, uh, Google spun up the Kubernetes open source project, and uh, we do have a hosted version of that that we run on Google Cloud Platform, so I help a lot of customers get their stuff onto that and uh, rethink the pieces that don't quite fit into that mold yet today. I'm Matthew Garris. I am a security developer at CoreOS. Uh, focusing on trying to improve container security from the boot process through the operating system up to the container runtime and even contains themselves. Hey guys, hey, Lee Calcote. Uh, over at uh, SolarWinds, I run um, technology strategy there. Uh, if you know, love, use, and uh, SolarWinds products, come, come, come talk to me, come tell me what you don't like. If you're into containers and you think SolarWinds should be as well, come tell me. Thanks, gents. All right. That microphone is notably lonely. Don't let the microphone be lonely and then ask me anything. Yeah, all right. Thank you. To get started, uh, this question uh, will uh, go to Lee. What do you think uh, the future of containers as infrastructure objects will be? For instance, do you think there will be another container technology to challenge and complement Docker? Do you think abstractions like Mesos, K Kubernetes, and Rancher will ultimately make the kind of container an implementation detail rather than something that actually matters? Yeah, great, great question. I may have to take off my SolarWinds hat on this one and, and speak, uh, speak off the record. Um, you know, I, I think um, leaving that hat on for a second, I'll say that and I think I've said this before. I've heard others say it as well. Is that um, you know we we need we need multiple tools. We need we need um, we need competitive offerings. Um, I think um, just sort of here in America, I think we've kind of proven maybe or hopefully proven capitalism and, and kind of competition is a good thing. Um, I think we've also kind of proven that for any of those that rise to the top, um, maybe whether it was Microsoft or Apple or Google or VMware, at some point, people start to despise those that are just clearly dominating. And so just I think it's healthy that um, we've got uh, folks doing, um, bringing forward other types of capabilities. Um, I think that 
uh, to the extent that we begin to view containers as just an implement, you know, the, the container engine itself as an implementation detail and what we're focused on is, um, you know, orchestration of those. You know, I don't, I think that there will always be a segment of that population, and maybe that's, maybe you guys represent that, that in fact do care and those differences are meaningful. Um, you know, taking my hat off for a second, I will say that just having been in the ecosystem for about three years now, um, you know, I've begun, the, just the, there's a lot of politics involved. And actually, that kind of plays on it as well. And, and uh, I got to say, some of it's become tiresome for me. And that actually begins to play into, uh, you know, the my technological choices as well. So we have a question. Um, so there was a comment made earlier that um, that containers can better utilize the hardware than uh, VMs. So could you elaborate on that? So I mean, like. You'll find a lot of services or, or people, you know, running their own systems, uh, running their containers in VMs, uh, and a lot of that has to do with the the security benefits of, of you know if somebody were to break out of a container, and then they're only within the VM, so they're still that very far step away from the host. Um, like running your containers in bare metal, though, you'll you'll get that performance boost. You know, you won't have to go through the hypervisor level. Um, and, and there are ways to do that. You can run containers uh, within containers, uh, like you can run Docker within LXC and wrap it with an AppArmor profile, and you can wind up just skipping the whole hypervisor layer, and you can wind up with a, a pretty decent system that way. So another aspect of that is that um, if you're using VMs, if you're basically running a VM per application, then you're duplicating a lot of code. You've got a separate kernel per component. You've got a separate C library. You've got a lot of code that is unnecessarily duplicated. And also, when you're bringing up a container as a VM, you're having to statically allocate those resources up front. You're saying this system is going to have say, a gigabyte of RAM. Whereas if you're using namespace-based containers, things can just app allocate memory as they're using it, free it as they're using it, and that will be returned to the entire system pool. So it's a lot easier to over-provision a container-based solution without having to worry about running out of resources. Anybody else? All right, another question from the audience. This time we are facing an, a new hype about around serverless computing like lambdas and Azure functions or however they're called. Um, how do you see the areas where um, they don't um, replace containers or can they coexist and why do we need containers in the future? Why do we want them? It almost seems that the serverless movement obviates the container movement in some ways. It's a really interesting question. You want to take a stab at that, Google? <laughs> <laughs> so it's difficult to speak for Google on that, obviously. Um, but I do think that they're going to have an easy time coexisting because initially uh, the problems that they solve are going to be very different. It's really easy to bring forward your existing workloads and programs uh, into this container ecosystem with a little bit of thought and a little bit of work, but reworking those chunks that your our business is already reliant on uh, into serverless functions, which uh, currently have a lot of limitations. I don't know how much you've uh, played with those, but a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, they're based on it sort of being an event-driven programming. Uh, so the sort of inputs and outputs of those are very limited. Uh, I do think that there are a lot of times where when you need just one chunk of code to fire uh, when certain events happen, that obviously the path of like a serverless function that you can just upload somewhere and it's going to fire every time that that event happens is going to uh, eventually become so frictionless that that will be a really good paradigm for those kinds of workloads. And I do hope eventually serverless is something that like expands and be uh, mostly just because the management of not having to deal with servers makes it a really attractive offering. Um, but there's definitely going to be a time, I believe, for several more years where uh, 
you can do certain workloads in either one of those scenarios, uh, but there's going to be a lot of work that, uh, uh, because of the different inputs and outputs that you can get in and out of uh, containers versus like a serverless uh, uh, function that they're going to live side by side and have sort of different domains. If I could lift the level of that question just a moment, rather than thinking of the serverless architecture, gentlemen, um, what about the idea of just transient workloads? So instead of thinking about the implementation of it as serverless, what, what, what do transient workloads look like in a container world versus a VM world, and then maybe taking it to the serverless world? Okay. <laughs> Give it a shot, and even to parlay off of, um, of of Mr. Google here, Mr. GCP. That's Joe. Joseph. <laughs> yeah. uh, is that you know for those of us that are, for, for, and I think this is maybe representative of uh, the general audience here. For those of us that have um, inner geeks inside and that are fed by technology, and and our juices get flowing, kind of uh, if I can use that metaphor uh, about technology, it can be really frustrating just how slowly technology is adopted. And so moving into you know, unikernels or serverless, or does one obviate the next? Or um, you know, from my perspective, back to that, that tooling um, analogy that I was using, you need a bunch of different tools to accomplish different things. You've got different tasks at hand. You've got different levels of maturity in those organizations. Um, you've got folks that are younger than others, folks that are older than others, uh, just different perspectives that come to bear. All of that actually plays a role in, what techno in the technology selection. I think that um, all of those things are going to coexist for quite some time. Mainframe still process probably the credit card transaction I did this morning. So, um, but but to your question, Boyd, I think you were saying you know from a transient perspective and a portability uh, perspective, workloads that um, if you've written them in such a way that um, they can be ported, um, I think that's actually. Part of my frustration as well is that um, for everywhere that you see a, a VM today, there's a use case for a container. Um, and if you're using containers in a distributed systems type way, in a microservices type way, that probably that might mean some rewriting and might mean that, hey, it's even harder to, you're going to find that people are moving even more slowly that way. And when I say people, I mean the general masses altogether. If, if you guys are visiting conferences like these, you're, you're not getting fed the general sense of kind of what organizations do. So my hope is, is that we can deliver on that because portability is really part of the, the promise here. So another question from the audience. What are your thoughts on Alpine moving to Libre SSL and additionally, what do you think or foresee that any other base images in the future will do or make a move like that? I think this is quite difficult for a general purpose operating system to do. Uh, the, there are a number of applications that, for better or worse, use functionality in OpenSSL that's been removed from LibreSSL. And the problem we then have is that LibreSSL, OpenSSL use the same header files, uh, they use the same function names. If you have an application that ends up through a dependency path using libraries that link to both OpenSSL and LibreSSL, then you'll get confusing behavior and probably completely inexplicable crashes. So for someone like Debian or Ubuntu to move to LibreSSL, that would be a really huge challenge. Something like Alpine that is much more focused on solving a much smaller set of problems, I think that's actually something that makes a great deal of sense. Uh, I think that there's a... I think that it is going to be a little while until we see what the SSL ecosystem really shakes down to in the longer run. The OpenSSL project is doing a lot of good work themselves on improving the state of things. But for the kind of focus that Alpine has, I think the change makes sense. I'd be surprised if other base images follow in the same way. All right, next. Yeah, so just basically drawing off of your personal experiences, a lot of times enterprise will see an offering of, let's say, a cluster manager, and it'll have the features that it wants, and it'll say, oh, okay, let's go ahead and use this without really properly evaluating its performance at the proper scale and consequences of the architecture choices that, let's say, the cluster manager has made, so the pros and cons of that. In your experience, what has been the best way to evaluate an offering like that and um, kind of 
um, evaluate it based on its performance at like a massive scale that um, some enterprise will be trying to support while using that offering. Well, since he said massive scale, Joe. <laughs> um, so that is an interesting question. And in my particular role as someone who works with end customers, uh, almost all the time in that scenario, uh, customers want experiences from other customers <laughs> more than they want like a plan to evaluate that that's important and that comes up but more than that you know uh when you have a customer who's looking uh, rolling out a, a cluster manager to use that uh terminology across a giant fleet of machines and then maybe have it hybrid and uh they're remaining on premises and uh one or more online cloud providers like they're really happy about test plans, but what they really want to hear is like Home Depot has already done this, right? It worked, right? Like that, that's what most people want to hear. Uh, and there are companies that are doing a little more trailblazing with some of these uh, cluster managers. And I think that really the proof that comes down from those customers and their experience, and a lot of them are very forthcoming at events like this, uh, that tends to be the best test plan that you can get. Find somebody who's as close to you, who's already been there, and uh, uh, like go, it, go to one of their uh, uh, talks at an event like this and then go up to them afterwards and talk to them about it. Really quick, since I've held this mic longer, I, I would say that there's a fantastic question. I think a lot of you don't work at Rancher, do you? Because because Rancher has a good uh, you know just a solution for helping people try those things out. I actually believe that um, while you know one of the promises of people moving to and using a container orchestrator, to use that term, um, is is scale. Um, I really don't believe that many organizations are ever going to get there. Get there to the point that. Any of the uh, any of the software that's any of those orchestrators that are available today don't already hit those points. Um, you know, I think that anyway. I just I don't know that I think there's a number of other considerations kind of before you get to scale. Yeah, that, yeah, if you don't mind. Uh, that that is a fair point. One of the really nice things about a well built uh, cluster manager is it does get you back into the land that we were once in when Moore's Law was all happy. That like you can just throw some more resources at it if it's not the most uh, you know, performant. The obligatory Moore's Law reference. <laughs> no, that's awesome. All right, another question from the audience. What are your thoughts on running stateful services on containers and, and cluster managers, things like Elasticsearch or Cassandra, and running that at scale in the way we want to? So, I mean, it, it, unfortunately, the, the answer is it depends, um, depends on your, your willingness to take on risk. Like, I mean, your data is your business, right? Your, your information is your business. Uh, I, I tend to, what I typically advise to customers, if like, if you're know containers well, and you know, the ins and outs really well and, and where data is being written and tracking it really well, cause it's, it's finicky. It can be really finicky. Um, then, then go for it. You know, that's, it's, it's not the end of the world to actually have data on your, your cluster. You just need to know the, the risks around it. Uh, but what, so like barring that, barring that level of expertise, I just say, you know, have your, your data in a separate place. Your data is your snowflake, put it on like traditional VMs or dedicated gear, have it on like specialized hardware, high IO, good, uh, good, you know, block, read, write, and just make it a separate place to store that precious, precious data. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> it really comes down to what technology for what purpose, right? And I think containers and, and the customers at Oracle that, that are just, you know, getting into this and it really runs a gamut, everything from some really heavy users to people just, you know, dipping their toe in the water. <laughs> Excuse me. I think it really comes down to CX, which is customer experience. Containers are really good as front end workers that you can modify and change that experience very, very quickly. Behind that, I've seen some great implementations where there's a middleware and a database layer. And my company is really good at that 
right? Containers are really good at changing the customer experience very quickly. And when I ask people why they why are they doing containers, you know, there's multiple reasons: portability, um, you know, configuration considerations of the server, agility, and the ability to pump code faster. This, you know, laundry ops that uh, Boyd's talked about is the primary reason. So CX, that CX layer, you know, I saw a great implementation by a regional bank. And if you think about it, a bank, what is their competitive differentiator now, right? It's their mobile app experience and the browser experience for the customer. It's not the teller experience anymore. So these people created a great front end and in regional banks, so they got to compete against the big guys. And they're doing that in containers. And, and that's working really, really well. So use the technology where it's most appropriate. Well, let me just let me add to that that it would be great to be at a point where you can just run your your stateful services and it just works. You don't have to say, well, if you really are knowing what you're doing and if you really are careful, we want to get to the point where we solve this problem. And just like a Cassandra cluster with enough replications, you would like to have that smartly replicating your stuff, various clouds moving around different regions in the cloud, and dealing with policy driven kind of uh, factors like that. But I don't think we're there yet, and I'm hearing the feedback that you know not even this next year is likely to be the case. So, good good feedback. This is a really good question, and I would really suggest that we um, we run at least one open space on persistence. Um, and can can you guys uh, commit to a few of you uh, you know showing up there? Yeah, I mean persistence is one of the big ones. Um, go ahead, Carly. So uh, last year when we did container days, um, people, most of the audience just kind of toying with containers um, and a small percentage of them were actually using it in production. Um, what do you think enterprises are today uh, from your experiences and what are like the primary use cases that people are using, you know, container technologies for? One of you have an enterprise customer you can talk about? All right. <clears throat> so again, in the enterprise, I think it really runs the gamut of where, where people are. And I can even think of one large insurance company where it's, it, it depends by department, you know, kind of where they are and what they're doing. I think what they're really trying to do is, again, look at, look at ways to increase that agility. They are taking, they are going in the microservices path, right? So they, they know that they want to break up a monolithic application. And again, tool the pieces of that that are most customer facing and bring those out into microservices. So, um, and, and they're doing these with open source technologies versus, you know, big uh, monolithic legacy technologies. Um, and again, I, I see it across the front end. That's, that's really where uh, the majority of the work that I see being done. And it's typically, again, retooling and breaking off a piece of a larger application in that front end. Try to, I'll try to toss in a couple of things here. Um, uh, one is that just um, statefulness and security have kind of been, you know, um, part of the hindrance to adoption. And fortunately, we've got folks working on, I think, you, you know, maybe even changing the game to where um, security concerns are actually bringing people to containers because they're seeing um, maybe things are even better than in other worlds. Um, you know, in Kubernetes land and, and other lands, um, you know, persistent volumes and uh, pre-provisioning and dynamic provisioning, e e even um, back to that speed, the notion of speed, um, those things are forthcoming with um, to provide stateful services. Um, I'll give a quick example. So used to run cloud engineering at, at Seagate. Um, our use case for uh, containers at the time was um, telemetry information. So Seagate, um, as you know them, sells a bunch of storage media. They also sell um, storage systems. I, Ryan, I don't know that there are any back in the data centers back here, but um, uh, the, that but the systems themselves are capable of hardware diagnostics. When a drive fails or a fan um, uh, breaks, uh, they'll send a small diagnostics package back home. Uh, so they'll call home. Um, we needed to process that those um, diagnostics packages. And so we used, in this case, um, OpenShift um, to do that. OpenShift was the, the layer at which we were running containers there was just um, digesting, parsing through those messages and persisting them to 
um, a Hadoop cluster, so a 20 node Hadoop cluster. So our data was um, important. Um, not that, and I think this was a little over a year ago, and we weren't um, at the level that we were either comfortable with um, how volumes were being managed, and so we tethered that system to um, Hadoop in this case. We kind of used Kafka to help us go between. But. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Lee. Question from Jeff Lindsay. Hello. Um, Hopefully this will be a, a fun one. Some people have asked, uh, you know, what are future trends and stuff like that. I think it's more useful uh, to, um, you know, know what you want to build, what you want the future to be. So I'm curious uh, from your perspectives, you know, what is sort of your ideal scenario out of all of this? Um, you know, you don't have to be right, but what do you want? Like, what do you want from these systems? Uh, great ideation question. Uh, for our part, um, you know, working on on Kubernetes Rackspace, one of the things we're we're squarely focused on is is the developer experience of actually getting one of these things into the hands of customers. Um, like we we typically liken it our our, our model for thinking about it as uh, crawl walk run. Um, you know, sure you can you can run these things on their own, um, but that's really not your kind of your end goal is to to run these things on your own. You want to build on top of them, so. Can you, if, if we can get something into the hands of customers really easily and, and let them kick the tires on it uh, for, for whatever level of expertise they have, it's, it's you know, super easy to get started with some than others. Um, you know, and it also depends on, on what scale they need for which one they should choose. But regardless of those, you know, or orthogonal to those decisions, let's make it easy to get those things in their hands so they can try it out. Maybe they want to take it in-house. These are all open source solutions. They can bring it in-house. That's fine. That's great. Um, but let's make it easy for them to actually start using these things and we can increase the rate of adoption across the industry and just kind of grow the market for all of this stuff. So from the kind of more security perspective, uh, one of the things that's really a problem in security these days is getting new features out to people, getting new functionality out to people, but also getting new updates out to people. And I think one of the big benefits of containerization is not so much the containerization itself, but the way that it makes it easier to enable distributed environments. And one of the strengths of a distributed environment is that, well, if you design it correctly, you should be resilient to losing some number of your systems, some number of your containers, some number of your nodes. Which means that when you build your cluster, you no longer have to necessarily think about having completely separate production and test environments. A small amount of your production environment can be your test environment. And if that falls over, that's fine. The rest of the cluster will take up the slack. And so you can, rather than having to validate everything in a completely separate testing environment first, you're able to have confidence that it works in the real production environment. And so you can push out updates much more aggressively. So I think that's going to be potentially a huge benefit from the entire eco internet ecosystem security uh, perspective. I think having containers is, is a vital part of that. I, I, I guess to kind of add on, let's say we had, you know, containers, everybody's adopted containers. What next? I mean, what do you want now? I guess is a bit, kind of a different way of trying to go for like longer term, what you guys want from your perspectives. So far, great answers too. I just wanted to add that in there if anybody else wanted to add on. Let's, uh, let's propose that as an open space. Richard will wrap it up. I believe the gentleman from CoreOS has said, I don't always test, but when I do, it's in production. <laughs> or at least that would be a really cool future state, right? <laughs> we can we can make that meme a reality. <laughs> That's a that is a really amazing answer. That is so cool. All right, Richard, what you got? So, uh, like a lot of people here, I I guess I'm not speaking for you guys, kind of am. Um, you know, show up here, we're all kind of wandering, looking for answers. Um, one of the things that I've kind of like glommed onto is that the question I'm trying to get answered is. It seems like there are two universes when we talk about containers and we talk about IT architecture. And that is we have the cluster, cluster manager, and containers. And we have all those things that aren't clusters and managed by the, by the um, cluster scheduler, right? So we have, if you're an AWS, you have RDS databases. Uh, if you're running your own Kafka clusters, they're running on EC2 instances or, or whatever, right? How do we... And it's, it seems like there is a, a gulf in binding those two things together, 
right? When I provision containers, I also want to provision storage, and maybe I don't want that storage to be running as a container. Maybe it's more performant to actually run that on dedicated hardware. And so what is your vision or ideas for binding those things together, or should they remain separate? Because it seems like uh, those of us that do have the problem end up having to write a lot of our own tooling, which may not also be the right answer. <laughs> and remember, we have proposed an open space for that already as well. Yeah, maybe I'll, <clears throat> I'll take this from a, a network perspective, potentially, um, and maybe even back to Jeff's um, question earlier, um, that, that there can be a, that, that gulf that you're referring to kind of between, from a network perspective, folks that are used to doing that in physical environments and over the last decade or so have come to be comfortable with uh, virtual networking. And then, you know, I'll go so far as to say there's there's container networking. I've um, written a few um, few articles on that recently and gotten folks arguing with me whether or not there's container networking or just networking. It's like, well, there is virtual networking at, at, at minimally. But to, to, your, to your question, um, you know, one of the things that I'd like to see is uh, us bridging those divides a, a bit better, us making people who have had long careers in... Um, managing infrastructures, uh, infrastructures non-containerized, much more comfortable with how it is that those same concepts um, map into the containerized environment. And I think that's true for storage as well with your examples about RDS. <clears throat> um, so my hope is, I don't know, maybe, you know, for companies like SolarWinds to come in, step in and, and help um, bridge part of that divide. I don't think, I don't think SolarWinds is doing a, a good job of that today, so. Thanks, Lee. All right, um, last question. Um, data, cent <clears throat> data centers that provide um, a platform as a service uh, can do really neat things with virtual machines, right? They can oversubscribe their underlying hardware where um, you don't get that much resources till you actually use them and kind of migrate the VM elsewhere when you actually use the resources. So this is something that's, like migration is something that's not possible with containers. Uh, so, uh, is, is that a is that a concern for the data centers, or is there a roadmap <clears throat> for the uh, for the orchestration to actually have these kind of features? So, I think uh, the question is based on a not entirely correct premise. Uh, it is absolutely possible to migrate containers. The checkpoint restoring user space functionality that's part of Linux now makes it possible to take entire process trees, and then freeze them, obtain their state, migrate that somewhere else, and bring them back up. So uh, from that perspective, there's nothing fundamental about containers that prevents you from having exactly the same functionality here. Cool. That's you know, on that, I'll say that um, one of the projects out there, um, LexC and, and LexD, um, primarily you know, supported by Canonical, um, takes advantage of, I pronounce it Cryu, but I think it's, is it Cryu or is it Cryu? I don't we, Okay, could be both, could be, you know, Kube, Cuddle, Cube, CTL, same, you know, potato, potato, cluster manager, container orchestrator. Um, but anyway, point being is, I think back to what uh, Matthew was saying is, uh, you know, it also, that function is either, functionality is either important in some environments, and I think LexD, that type of environment where people are using containers for infrastructure uh, use cases. They're using infrastructure containers versus kind of applica application containers, which wherein you have like a singular process. Infrastructure containers, you typically have multiple processes. Maybe you've sort of lifted and shifted your VM use case into an infrastructure container. LexD and Cryu, or that ability to free state and move it over, I think is important in those environments and those use cases. For use cases where you've got singular process containers or maybe better described uh, distributed systems, um, you know, microservices, that you, where you just expect things to get blown away, that um, the ability to checkpoint and restore um, perhaps isn't even, you know, isn't, isn't really a consideration. But. Thank you. Okay, because it's me and Karthik knew what he was getting when he asked me to do this, I'm going to point something out. Solar Winds, Core OS, thank you for making the effort to come out. Google, thank you for making the effort to come out. Oracle, thank you for making the effort to come out. Rackspace, thank you for making the effort to come out. Support the community. There's somebody missing from the panel.
kind of the elephant in the room. Gents, how do you think about, how do you think about the uh, health of the container ecosystem? Is there enough diversity? For context, containers have become nearly synonymous with Docker. Docker itself seems to be offering its own solutions against every ecosystem player out there. Is this healthy? Is there a historical pattern we could reason from that helps us see where this might be going? Are you concerned? What do you think we'll be talking about with respect to the topic of the health of the ecosystem around containers, not Docker, next year at this time? And I'd like each of you to answer as our closing thoughts. So I'll just hand the uh, mic to Everett and let it go from there. Or actually, since Mike is ready, I'll do that, and then you guys can go from there. Well, I think what's interesting <clears throat> um, with the advent of, I think, 1.12, within Docker is what, what, what I've read about is Docker bloat, right? Where more and more uh, functionality is being jammed into the Docker engine itself, uh, particularly swarm functions and, and that type of thing. And it's gonna be, I think it's, if we go a year from now, I think it's gonna be interesting to see how um, that platform evolves, how uh, you know, swarm is adopted in general as, as maybe the, the orchestrator. Um, <clears throat> I think that's going to be something interesting to watch. Of course, the bloat itself is being, you know, countered against companies like CoreOS, you know, is, is saying, you know, that's not a good thing, right? So I think it'll be interesting to watch just how this thing evolves over the next year because I think there's, you know, as much following as Docker has that, <clears throat> you know, they could actually shoot themselves in the foot a little bit by by over-engineering and over-bloating the, the engine itself. And, and for me, I, I, that's going to be the one thing I'm going to be watching over the next few months. Thanks, Mike. So I, I definitely subscribe to like use the best tool for the job. Um, if, if Docker works for you, great. If Rocket works for you, great. Um, if LXD works for you, great. Like, uh, I, I've confessed to like finding a little frustration, um, you know, in the industry when it's people want to use a different solution. So not only do they go ahead and like start, you know, working towards that solution, but they, they find a need to discredit or, or somehow, uh, you know, express frustration with other projects in, in really weird ways, in my opinion. Um, it's, it's unfortunate to see, uh, and but I mean, it's, it's not, not uncommon in the industry. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see less of it though, uh, personally. I'd rather see if people uh, want to use a particular solution that they go ahead and they, they develop that solution, they use it, they commit to it, and great. That, and that speaks to the competition that there, there should be within the container ecosystem. I, I think it's healthy, I really do. Um, in terms of you know what we're going to be talking about a year from now, the container engine I think is going to become probably commoditized, and the real battleground is going to be the image format. And I suspect we'll be talking about that next year. That's an interesting prediction, Everett. Thank you. Next, thanks, Joe. Uh, so I agree with a lot of what has already been said. Um, in that there's a real advantage to diversity and having competition and all of us driving each other forward. And also that there can be some political frustrations uh, in this space sometimes. Um, my hope is that in a year we're talking less about container and image formats and more about um, actually getting your work running on large clusters of machines. So like the cluster management piece that's already I feel like sort of taking over container days. Now, I hope that will continue uh, to grow in the next year. Uh, you did ask about, are there any uh, parallels maybe that we can draw to something else? I did ask a couple of my coworkers about that uh, before I came because you seeded that question uh, for us. And one of the uh, interesting ones that uh, another member of my team brought up was uh, actually Java. <laughs> Uh, you know, Java being uh, owned and driven by Sun, but lots of open source and community uh, involvement around that. And it it's healthy. I think a lot of people in this room have workloads that they run on Java. I know that I have workloads I've written on Java and lots of customers who have. So it is possible uh, for there to be, you know, a strong commercial driving force behind uh, something that has open source uh, community behind it and is, you know, good for everyone. 
It's a great parallel to Java. Thank you, Joe. So uh, I'm going to try to be very careful here, and I do just want to emphasize that while I do work for CoreOS, I am not speaking for CoreOS right now, and nothing here is an official position. But having said that, the reason that Docker is synonymous with containers for so many people is that they've done a fantastic job of developing technology that made it easy for people to do this. And it, we all owe them an amazing debt of thanks for the work that they've done and continue to do in that respect. I think what we're going to see, however, is that as it's a young industry, fundamentally we are going to have different ideas about what needs to be done, about how problems should be solved. And in some cases, Docker solutions are going to be right and ours are going to be wrong, and in some cases, I think vice versa. And I think what's going to be most important for the ecosystem as a whole, rather than individual companies, is avoiding scenarios where people find themselves locked into a specific solution and then decide that was the wrong solution. Because that doesn't just hurt them, that hurts the perception of containers as a whole. So I think, I really hope that over the next year, we're going to continue the work on standardizing things that are common, making it easier for people to migrate between solutions and adopt whatever works best for them, rather than assuming that just because something came from one company, that something else that came from the same company is going to work just as well for a specific user. It's interesting. That's, that's two answers that say containers are plumbing and the interesting and, and should be standardized. And the interesting part is going to be building the house above it. It's very fascinating. Thank you, Matt. Lee? Yeah, I think that that's a natural um, evolution, that um, commoditization happens um, just all in around any, any offering that comes out, that ultimately you bring in different players. Um, uh, they, they begin, they, they cheapen their price. They give it out for free. It becomes a commodity, and you kind of move up. And um, I, I would say that um, that, that there's a, there's a war raging around um, orchestration. There's lots of fires and battlefields uh, that have been going on for a while. Um, I'm very, you know, for one, and, and I think I can, you know, speak for solar ones when I when I say this that you know, I think that it's a beautiful thing to have multiple tools. We already talked about different organizations, different use cases, but it also just opens up. Um, an entire, you know, an ecosystem for those to be agnostic and um, work in a in a vendor agnostic way to provide solutions across those, um, you know, proprietary well or those specific technologies. I do think that organizations like the Linux Foundation with um, OCI uh, are doing good things around um, trying to deliver on the promise of portability, which is really the promise of container, one of the probably more significant promises of containers in the first place is portability. Um, so to the extent that we can um, agree upon a container engine um, uh, specification and canonical implementation around Run C to the extent that we can have um, a standardized um, image format, a beautiful thing. I don't know if we really ever hit that with VMs. That's kind of um, disappointing. But thirdly, kind of looking forward to next year, I would hope that I would hope that we would be additive to um, what that OCI organization is looking to do and begin to standardize the um, declarative format in which you describe your application. So whether that looks like Compose or that looks like um, something else that you can describe that and that too, that description is also uh, portable. Great answer, Lee, thank you. You did say a canonical implementation though, just saying. <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, these, these guys have come from all over the place to give you answers. You guys, a bunch of introverts, got up and asked questions that made this a really great experience. Thank you very much. Let's get to open spaces planning.